Hello, this is Pro Cycles Tech Talk and I'm Carl. We're going to talk about suspension on our third part of a three-part series. Today the final part is going to be about rear suspension, shocks, spring rates, linkage, things like that. One of the common things all motorcycle manufacturers do is when they make rear suspension for the motorcycles, they always make it pretty soft suspension. They don't want anything that's threatening or, or a challenge to new riders, so everything's pretty soft. As your riding gets going along, you realize that you have a DR, a KLR, whatever your dual sport bike is, you realize you need a little better suspension. They bottom out, they pogo. Some people like them, but they're just not for everybody. So we're going to talk about uh, what kind of suspension, how we're going to determine spring rate, and details like that to get your suspension dialed to make more of an enjoyable ride. First question we usually get is about spring rates. What spring rate should I have? How do I determine spring rate? We determine spring rate just like we did with the front forks. It's the weight of the rider with your riding gear on. That is the constant number that's always going to be there. Now, most springs, uh, rear shocks have one, maybe two, th rarely three spring rates to choose from for the rear shock. It's not as critical as on the front to have a multiple choice of spring rate. The rear is a little bit more lax. So we have one, uh, like for the DR for example, we've got like the, the 7.5. 7.5 and I think that's for like with rider with gear we'll say that's roughly 240 pounds and under and then 240 pounds and over is going to be the 8.3 now just like fork spring rates shock spring rates have an overlap the top end of one spring rate where it says this is the maximum weight this spring can handle is about 10 percent into the next spring rate going so there is a little bit of a zone and we'll kind of uh, categorize that if you're going to do a lot of spring riding get the one that's a little softer if you're going to do lots of off-road riding get the one that's a little bit firmer should you happen to fall into that zone but for the most part getting a better shock spring on any of the bikes be it the klrs the xrs anything it's going to be a huge improvement in performance we got questions coming up any other questions we got going yet setting sag setting sag a very good question question sag is, is something that's it's uh it's almost like a mythological number where sag is supposed to be sag traditionally and a good starting point is whatever your overall travel is the pipe fully suspended when you sit on it one third should sag down when you're sitting on it so if you have 12 inches of travel when you sit on the bike the bike should compress about four inches you want to take and measure and pull the bike all the way up make sure it's fully extended as possible the front and rear suspension are all the way up and from your axle straight up to where the fender and the seat is just take a piece of masking tape and draw a line and measure from the center of the axle to that masking tape all the way up and we'll say for example let's say that's 30 inches up so when you sit on the bike you want that to only collapse four inches again just using one third as the just a general number so it should be down to 26 uh, inches if it's more or less than that, what you want to do with the shock is you want to take your ring adjuster and you want to subtract out, lengthen the spring up to offer more sag, or you tighten it up by going this way, compressing the spring will take less sag. That's going to make it tighter, put a little bit of preload onto the spring already to get that number. And also you want to take and set your front suspension up the same way. You want the front and rear to match. So if you set your one third of travel on the rear shock by this, you want to adjust your preload spacers, your shock spring, your fork spring spacers, so they'll the forks will also compress the same amount of number. And again, you just measure, you know, from the top of the fork triple tree down to it, like the axle, how much that fork compresses. Again, with you sitting on the bike, you want about one third of travel. Some people like more sag. They, they, uh, I myself and quite a few other guys, we want about half that travel in sag. Other guys want it firm as possible. They only want like an inch of sag. They want that thing rigid right off the start. And that's a personal preference. That's where, again, there's no set rule what sag has to be. You can set it up to what's comfortable, what you like. But the starting point, the good jumping off point is always going to be one third of travel. So yeah. what, what were you saying about the preload? The preload on the spring, where the, the spring is going to go into, the spring goes into the shock body here. You're going to add tension to the spring by taking your collars, and they're the spanding collars on the stock shocks, or the, the cogent's got the cool one piece. You're just going to wind that down, compressing the spring. That will make it firmer, and that's going to eliminate, give you less sag. Lightening it up, making it where it's lax as possible when you sit on it, will give you more sag. So there comes a point where you, it, there never comes a point where it's going to be all the way loose and rattle in there, but it will be, you know, I could get it about loose as possible, and that's going to give you where, where you need to be. If it's not the sag you want, you say, I can't get it there no matter what my adjustment is, you probably got the wrong spring. We could take a review of that case by case as it happens.
Okay, so uh, using other model shocks linkage. We've seen that happen, guys. I'm going to take a shock off the, the, the XYZ400 and I'm going to put it on this bike and, and you know, it fits. One of the things we got to remember is, is shocks by the manufacturer are designed for what bike they're going to go into. The valving, the spring rate, the length of the shock, the travel is designed to work on a particular bike for the linkage and swing arm length that bike has. If we take it off of something else and say, okay, I'm going to take this shock and I'm going to put it on another bike, the length may be the same, the mounting may be the same, but how this valving set inside to as the shock, the swing arm goes up and the shock compresses and gets tighter, how that valving reacts is designed to work with a particular length swing arm. So you can change out a, a, a shock and say, I got it off of this bike and I'm going to put it on that bike, and it may be different. That's not necessarily it's going to be better. You know, compared to some stock shocks, it may be a little bit better or, again, different. But you really want to stick with the shock that's made for your bike and just modify that, adjust that, be it with spring or the, the race tech valve kits or the cogent uh, kits, uh, the rebuild kits, or even just a replacement shock. Get something that's designed to work with your bike, your swing arm, and your linkage. That's where you're going to get your best overall results. As far as rear shocks go, is it similar like with automotive? Are there hydrogen or hydraulic shocks, nitrogen charged? Are there different types, and what are the benefits? Good question. There, there are on, on a lot of the street bikes, dual sport bikes, unless some of the big BMWs or something we're not that familiar with have uh, completely gas shocks. Most of the shocks that are going to be fluid. They're going to have fluid inside the chambers here, and if they have a reservoir, they're going to have nitrogen gas inside the reservoir. And you know the fluid compresses goes up the gas, or the fluid doesn't compress. The, the fluid moves up and down through the valving, compressing the gas inside the little cartridge there. And the valving inside the fluid goes up and down, uh, determines how well it dampens on suspension or rebounds as it goes back down the valving. But most of the time, uh, about 99% of all shocks are going to be all fluid or a fluid and gas mix. We've never seen it again. It's very rare to have just a completely gas, a, a whole nitrogen type shock, like an automotive. Okay. How do lowering links affect your suspension? Good question. Lowering links, one of the common uh, myths about lowering links is lowering links is going to shorten your suspension travel. It doesn't. What lowering links actually do is lower the chassis. They, that's exactly what they're designed to do. We're going to take the seat height <clears throat> and you're going to take lowering links. They're going to lower everything an inch. It's going to take that seat height and lower it an inch. Your suspension travel is still the same. The shock goes up and down just as much as it did before. There, there's no modification to that. It's just the linkage gives the, the brings actually brings the chassis down lower. The, the other side of when we start with lowering links and we do some of the other functions where we could use the second mounting hole like on DRs or other bikes that have two inch lowering links, one of the issues you may have is under full compression, the rear tire may hit the inside of the, the underside of the rear fender. And so that, again, that's only under full compression. I doubt that's gonna happen just driving down the street. But if you take small jumps or it's really harsh environment, you're on the throttle a lot, you have the potential to having that tire bottom out on the inside of the rear fender. But lowering lengths are great to get that bike down a little bit uh, shorter, should you want it to be. But again, it's one of those things where if you drop the rear end with the lowering lengths, we're gonna drop it. We wanna match the front lowering as well. So you wanna take and do the internals on some of them to, to flip the, the mount around so it drops the internal and matching amount inch or slide the fork tubes up inside the, the triple clamps an inch matching what the rear is. We don't want to take a bike and lower the rear and then the front end sits out like a chopper. It's gonna sit at an angle and then the front end suspension just doesn't feel right at that point. Rear end really won't feel right at that point. So whatever we lower the rear, we wanna match that and lower the front so the bike still sits on the same plane, the motor's still at the same angle so we don't have oil that's gravitating to the back because now it's tilted all the time. So we want to make sure we take our, our bike and lower whatever we lower the rear, want to match that on the front. And again, it doesn't shorten the suspension travel, it actually just lowers the chassis. Is shock fluid the same as fork oil? Or is there a difference? It's it's for the most part it's the same. Until we get into the real high-end shocks again on street bikes and road race bikes, it's gonna be the same. 
you know, it's going to be an oil that doesn't suds and it takes high temperature, but it's always going to be a lighter weight. It's not going to obviously be like motor oils that are detergent oils or have this property or that. It's just going to be a straight type of oil that's a much lighter weight that's allowed to go through the valving. And with the, uh, the shock fluid, again, just like we talked about the last time with forks, if we use a heavier weight shock fluid, it is going to slow the travel down again, but again, that's going to create more friction, more heat, and it's going to cause this shock to expand. Now, the shock being we have nitrogen and we have all this filled 100% with a fluid, as the fluid expands, it has nowhere to go. In a, in a fork suspension, you have air at the top of that, so you compress that air a little bit as that fluid gets hot, and maybe it raises one or two millimeters, something like that inside, inside a fork. It, doesn't have the room to do that inside a shock. So something's got to give. That expansion and everything's hot, a little bit more flexible. It's usually going to be the seal out the bottom that's going to blow out. If we put a heavier weight pork oil in there, excuse me, shock oil in there, and then ride it kind of vigorously, it's going to get hot, it's going to expand. That expansion has to go somewhere. And it's usually the seal is the one that suffers. What is the benefit of going from an OEM rear shock to a shock such as Kojin or Olin? Well, again, uh, OEM, uh, they designed a the shock to be a good all-around general purpose shock, and they don't know if it's a seasoned rider or first-time rider. So they want to make this as probably as comfortable and non-threatening as possible. So as you ride, as you, even first-time riders, as their uh, skill levels progresses and they get more and more, they need a little bit more out of the bike. That's where the aftermarket manufacturers, again, be it Cogent, uh, uh, Race Tech, any of the guys, they're designing something that's a little bit uh, more performance-oriented. So they're making something like Cogent makes their shocks designed for the DR650 what the DR is going to do. And they do the same with the KLRs or any of their street bikes they make. They design that shock for the environment that bike's going to live in and it's more performance oriented. It definitely has more aggressive valving so the compression is, is a little bit more adjustable. You can set the compression to make it you know, compress faster and maybe rebound a little bit slower the other way around or have them to match. Uh, again, you could tailor it to what you want the rear of the motorcycle to do. But aftermarket shocks uh, definitely a lot more, more performance oriented. You could tailor it and, and they're just more aggressive right off the, the start. Is there more regular maintenance you'd like to see more riders uh, perform on their bikes as far as the rear shock goes? Yeah, one of the things is keep that shaft clean. You know, the, one of the downsides is, is we've, we've seen it happen as grit and grind get in there, as it's going to be slung up by the rear wheel, and the compression goes up and down that grit and grind, the real fine stuff has the potential of sliding up in there and getting caught up in behind this plate where the seal is, and then it's going to destroy the seal and you're going to leak. What we don't want to do is when you go to the, the, the do-it-yourself car wash, just take the magic twanger, the spray thing, that pressure will blow right through there. And you don't want to do that. You just kind of, the best way I've seen, and it's tough to do when it's inside the spring and everything, but I usually just take like some Windex or, or even like WD-40 and I just kind of soak it down to we can see all the grime go down to the bottom and then just take like a towel and wrap it around or go around a few times. Something you don't have to do late, uh, daily, but as you, if you go for a big weekend ride and you come back from a big weekend ride, take a look at it, inspect it. If you see a little bit of film, a little grime on there, clean it off. You know, that's just going to save you from having to take it apart. It's, it's not impossible to rebuild a rear shock, but it is a pain in the butt for it. The fact you got to take it out of the motorcycle, you got to suspend the motorcycle to remove the shock, and then disassemble it. You got to take all the gas out, and then you got to go get the gas recharged. It's, it's, e it's not easy to do, it's, it's possible to do, but it's a pain in the butt to do. All right, this is it. We're going to have more uh, subjects. Uh, tell us what you'd like to hear about. We're going to do more subjects. This wraps up our one on suspension. Thank you for watching ProCycle.